Welcome to session nine of the Ikna ILF uh, Quran series. This week, inshallah, we will have the title, Are We the Best of Nations? And we'll be studying Surah Al Imran verses 102 to 110. Um, this week's presentation, inshallah, will be delivered by Brother Riaz Larif. And inshallah, I will pass on to him. All right. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا اللهم اهدنا واهد بنا وجعلنا سببا لمن احتدى اللهم أمين يا رب العالمين so my dear brothers, uh, today I was asked to give a brief tafsir of the ayat from Surah Al Imran and the verses that were assigned to me were from uh, 102 to 110. I mean, honestly speaking, uh, these verses uh, can be actually split into uh, five different parts and each part can take about 20 to 30 minutes. So I won't be able to do uh, justice to give a full tafsir on these verses. What I'm going to do is inshallah give you uh, an overview of what these uh, verses mean. And then I'm going to hone in on the last verse, uh, that is verse number 110, and uh, talk a little bit uh, in detail about that particular verse. But before we go into uh, verse 102, we need to understand the background of these verses, which uh, starts around 98 and 99, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لِمَا تَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ تَبُغُونَهَا إِوَجًا وَأَنْتُمْ شُهَدَا وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing uh, the people of the scriptures, the people of the book, and saying, Say, O oh people of the scripture, why do you avert from the way of Allah those who believe, seeking to make it deviant, while you are witnesses to the truth, and Allah is not unaware of what you do? So uh, the Azbab and Nuzul, the, the reason why these uh, verses were revealed, and some of the Mufassirin, uh, they give this explanation. And we all know from history that uh, before uh, the arrival of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, uh, there were fights going on between the Aus and Khazraj, the two tribes in uh, Medina, uh, the two Arab tribes in Medina. They were fighting, as a matter of fact, uh, some historians say that the fights were going on for about uh, over a hundred years. And just before the arrival of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, between three to five years, a battle happened between uh, uh, between Aus and Khazraj with the help of the Jewish tribes in that place. And the battle's name is called Battle of Bu'ath. And again, we don't have the time to go into all the details of the Battle of Bu'ath. Uh, that is something, inshallah, you can uh, take it as a homework or a research item that you can look into, inshallah. So in that battle, uh, the Aus and the, the Aus were supported by Banu Nadir and Banu Quraida, and the Khazraj were supported by uh, Banu Qainuka. So they fought, and it was a very bloody battle. So eventually, after the battle, the, the two tribes, they came together and they wrote a peace treaty and they assigned to have uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay uh, as the leader uh, of the two tribes. So during this time, of course, when this was going on, uh, the invitation was sent to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to, uh, he came to Medina and he united uh, both the Aus and Khazraj and whom we dearly call the Ansar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I, mean, I mean, keeping this background in mind, now you look at uh, this particular verse, and what happened uh, was uh, there was a Jew by the name of uh, Shammam ibn Qais. He assigned, he was looking at the brotherhood between uh, Aus and Khazraj, and he did not like it. He wanted to uh, place some discord between them, create some discord between them. So he brought in a poet, 
and he asked that poet to uh, sing some poems, to uh, recite some poems from Jahiliya. Again, before when the fight was going on, each of these tribes, Aus and Khazraj, they wrote some poetical compositions highlighting their tribal pride and whatnot. And Shammaz ibn Qais, he brought this person, he uh, fed him with all these uh, poems, and he asked him to recite these verses when the Ansar were gathered together, when, uh, when Aus and Khazraj were gathered together. So that person came in and recited these poems highlighting the tribal uh, pride, which led to almost uh, a hand fight between uh, the Aus and Khazraj, at which point the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he came out and he said, what is this? What's going on here? Are you going back to Kufr? And again, the words that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used were, are you going back to Kufr? They did not say, I, don't be I didn't believe in Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. They did not say that I didn't believe in Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All they did was, they, for a moment, for a, la for, uh, for a moment, they forgot who they were and they were about to fight each other because of the tribal pride. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, are you going back to Kufr? Addressing what was going on. And keep this in mind, inshallah, as we go through. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses and telling the people of the book, O oh, people of the scripture, why do you take people away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you yourselves are witnesses to the truth? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after admonishing the people of the book, and then he turns around to the people, to the people who have believed, in this case, the Aus and Khazraj, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, Ya ayuha al-ladheena amanu, in tutiyu fariqan min al-ladheena utul kitaba yaruddukum ba'da imanikum kafirin. O you who have believed, if you obey a party of those who are given in the scripture, they would turn you back after your belief becoming unbelievers. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, wa kayfa takfuruna wa antum tutla alaykum ayatullahi wa feekum rasooluh. And how could you disbelieve while you are being recited the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and among you is his messenger? And look at the word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using. How could you disbelieve? Again, they did not say that I don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They did not say that I don't believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For a moment, they lost their uh, judgment and they were about to fight. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, how can you disbelieve? When, when the verses are being recited to you, when the prophet is among you, how can you disbelieve? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, And whoever holds firmly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has indeed been guided to the right, has indeed been guided to the right path. So this is the background, uh, if you will. So with this background, if you read the following verses, like I said, I'm not going to go into the details uh, of these verses for the sake of time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now looks at uh, addressing the believers. Ya yuhalladina amanu, ittaqullaha haqqa tuqatih, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Before I go into the translation and the tafsir of this, I want to kind of give you an overview. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after pointing out the mistakes that were done by uh, the, uh, the companions of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is teaching us, he is teaching the believers, he is teaching the Ansar at that time and also the believers until the day of judgment, what, constitu what, is, what constitutes Iman? What are the parts of Iman? When we talk about Iman, we just talk about the belief in the Prophet, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the six pillars of faith, if you will. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us more information for an individual and also as a, a collective a society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is laying out groundwork, what, what we need to have as Muslims, as Muslim community, what are the qualities we need to have? And the first quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that you need to have, you need to be God conscious. Ya ayuhalladina amanu, ittaqullaha haqqa tuqatih. And you fear Allah, you be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he should be feared. Wala tamutuna illa wa antum muslimun. And do not die except in the state of Muslim. So the first quality as Muslims, as a Muslim community, that we need to have is taqwa. And this is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a matter of fact, uh, in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, and Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, qala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ya Mu'ad, atadri ma haqqullaha ala al-ibad? Qala Allah, qala Allahu wa rasooluhu a'lam. 
قال أن يعبدوه ولا يشركوا به شيئا أتدري ما حقهم عليه قال الله ورسوله عالم قال ألا يعذبهم and Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he is narrating a hadith from Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As a matter of fact, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asking Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, do you know the right, uh, the right, Allah's right upon you? Mu'adh ibn Jabal, Allah, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asking Mu'adh ibn Jabal, do you know Allah's right upon you? And Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, he said, Allah wa rasooluhu alam. And uh, Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they know the best. That the right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have upon us is that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and we do not associate any partner with him. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked another question. Do you know your right upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the, again, the Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, he said that, only Allah and his prophet knows best. And on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that if you do it, then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will not punish you. Again, even though the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking specifically about the believing in Allah, uh, believing in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and not associating anyone with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it goes beyond that. The haqq tuqati, the haqq is not only believing in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, but actually following, transforming that belief into actions, meaning keeping away from the sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us to keep away from doing the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, obli uh, made, it, uh, made it obligatory. So we have to complete our obligations. We have to fulfill our obligations and keep away from the sins. Th then you are giving the right to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, this is coming to the, at the individual level. All of us need to follow. We need to have the belief then we also have to transform that belief into action and keep away from the sins and enjoy everything that is good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever obligations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put on you, we should fulfill those obligations. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go, uh, he goes to the next verse where he says, وَعَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, hold firmly to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not become divided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the brotherhood. The first quality as a Muslim, is what we should have is the is uh, piety, is righteousness, is God consciousness. The second quality is unity and brotherhood. And the second quality is, of course, is a collective quality. We need to have with one another. And if you go back a few verses, the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called them, are you going back to this belief? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask, uh, ask this question? They did not disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They did not be believe in this uh, uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But just fighting amongst themselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said that, why are you going to disbelieve? Why are you going, to, going back to jahiliyyah? So the qualities of a Muslim community, a jama'ah, is that we have taqwa first, then we have the brotherhood. So once we form this, Muslim community under these principles, then comes the responsibility. I'm going to go through a little bit uh, faster now uh, because we have only a few more minutes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then talks about the responsibility. Once we have the quality of piety and righteousness and God consciousness and brotherhood and unity, now comes the responsibility for the Muslim community where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَعْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and let there be a group from you inviting to all that is good and joining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. And those other people will be successful. Um, for a moment, I'm just going to skip this, uh, uh, skip talking about this because we are going to talk about this inshallah towards the end of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, your responsibility is forbidding evil and enjoining good. And then again, he reminds them, So do not be like those people. Do not be like those people who deferred and split the community up. Do not be, be, uh, be like them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about, if you were to do this responsibility, if you were to carry out this uh, responsibility, then you will have a reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the rewards and the punishment in the next verses. On that day, some faces will turn white and some faces will turn black. As for those whose faces turn black, to them it will be said, did you disbelieve after your belief? 
then taste the punishment for what you used to reject. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all those people whose face shine in the hereafter, whose faces are white with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ameen. So if we fulfill this functionality, if we fulfill this responsibility, if we fulfill this duty of forbidding the evil and enjoying the good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shower his mercy upon us and our faces will be shining on the day of judgment. And inshallah, we will enter Jannah and be there uh, eternally, for eternity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us one of them. Allahumma ameen. I'm going to skip through and come to uh, verse number 110. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after telling us what the responsibility is, telling us what the rewards and the punishment of carrying out and not carrying out the functionality, uh, uh, carrying out the responsibility. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding again the entire purpose of the Muslim community. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrujat linnas ta'amuruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he is telling us you are the best nation that is ever created on the face of this earth for mankind allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling you and i the best of nations the best of people and this title that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gives us it is not an unconditional title we have to become worthy of the title by fulfilling the responsibilities the duties that come with the title and that responsibility is we will only become worthy of this title of khayra ummah only when we fulfill the responsibility and carry out the responsibility of forbidding the evil and enjoining the good. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not stop there. Again reminds us, he said the same responsibility was given to the people before you to given to the people of the book they did not carry out the responsibility there were some believers from them but majority of them were transgressors they were fasik allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us after telling us what we need to do is also warning us don't be like the people who came before you who did not carry out the responsibilities that were given to them again the question comes to mind when we read this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about forbidding the evil. There are so many kinds of evil in the society. What evil should I fight against or struggle against? And we know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He also gives us the answer in the Quran as well, because we have the evil of alcohol we have the evil of interest we have the evil of fornication and adultery and fahsha and so many evils are going around domestic violence and racism all those evils prevail and exist in our world today now people are confused people need to know what evil should i struggle against and the mother of all evils the core of all evils is mentioned in the quran when luqman alayhi salam when he advised his son, When Luqman, when he was talking to his son, when he was advising his son, he said, Ya Bunay, oh my son. He said, Ya Bunay, la tushrik billah. Do not commit shirk. Do not associate anyone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in shirk la dhulmun azim indeed the shirk is the greatest of all evils and if you think about it my dear brothers and sisters majority of the evils that exist today is because people don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't believe that they are going to be held accountable when they return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we invite the mankind at large to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if if they realize that one day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hold you accountable and he will punish you or reward you based on how you live your life the issues the problems that we face they will slowly vanish away and the mother of all evils is shirk and that is what we have to struggle against as a matter of fact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran 
uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah An-Nisa that he will he will not forgive shirk at any cost but he will forgive any other sins for anyone whom he wishes inna allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih wa yaghfiru ma wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah uh, surah an-nisa that he will not forgive the sin of kufr but he will forgive anything else as a matter of fact this is the responsibility that we will be asked about when we meet allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Sahih al-Bukhari, there is a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, يَجِي أُنُوهٌ وَأُمَّتُهُ فَيَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى هَلْ بَلَّغُتَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the day of judgment, he will bring out the people of Nuh alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam, and he will, he will ask Nuh alayhi salam, هَلْ بَلَّغُتَ Have you conveyed the message? فَيَقُولُ نَعَمْ أَيْ رَبْ the Nuh salam will say, Ya Allah, I conveyed the message. I conveyed the message. Allah ta'ala li ummatihi hal then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn around and ask the people of Nuh salam, did he convey the message? Hal did he convey the message to you? And they will say, Fayakulun la ma ja'ana min nabi. They will say that no, no prophet came to us. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn around and ask Nuh alayhi salam, where is your witness? Where is your witness? I just asked you a question. I asked you, have you conveyed the message? And you said, yes. Now I'm asking your community. I'm asking your people, did you convey the message? And they are saying, no, that no prophet came to them. Who is your witness? If you are, if you are witnessing to the truth, if you are saying the truth, then who is your witness? فَيَقُولُ نُوحٌ مُحَمَّدٌ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَأُمَّتُهُ And Nuh alayhi salam will say that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam will be my witness and his ummah will be my witness and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said فَنَشْهَدُ أَنَّهُ قَدْ بَلَّقُ And we will witness that indeed Nuh alayhi salam conveyed the message and he, he also said, وَقَوْلُهُ جَلَّ ذِكْرُهُ وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَقُونُ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَقُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, towards the end of the hadith, he, he recited this verse from uh, Surah Baqarah where he said, And thus we have created you as a balanced community so that you may be witnesses over mankind and the Prophet will be witness over you. And my dear brothers, this is the greatest responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed upon us. And if you just go through what we have just read in the brief 20 minutes that we had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us the qualities that we should have as an individual Muslim and collectively as a society. We need to have the full taqwa and we need to be aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfill our obligations towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and keep away from the sins. And we have to come together and hold on to the cable of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be brothers in faith. So those are the two qualities Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned at the beginning of, the, uh, of these verses. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the responsibility of enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. Then he talked about the the rewards and punishments for carrying out and not carrying out uh, the responsibilities. And finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us again, do this, do this responsibility, and you will be the, you will be worthy of the title of Khaira Ummah. And we will be the best of nations. And again, reminding us, don't be like the people who came before you. Again, this is the responsibility. Conveying the message is the greatest responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed, placed upon us. And if we were to call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if one of them were to accept the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, فَوَاللَّهِ لِأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمْرِ النَّعَمِ That if Allah were to guide one person through you, then that is the best thing. You get that is every, that is better than everything else in the world. It is like earning millions and millions of dollars. You will be set for life. 
Again, we, I think we just got done. I guess I think we. Uh, I was told to stop at 25 minutes. We are right at 25 minutes. Inshallah, I'm going to pause here. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala enable us, give us the right understanding of our Deen, help us fulfill our responsibilities, and Inshallah, gather all of us in Jannah. Inshallah, Allahumma Amin. So, Brother Ashok, if uh, I'll turn this back to you. Uh, yeah, JazakAllah khair, brother Riaz. That's uh, great, inshallah, in, in terms of um, you know, guidance for us, inshallah. So we'll start the Q&A session. Uh, as we usually do, questions should be submitted in writing using the webinar platform. Go to the questions tab and submit your questions in, in writing. So inshallah, the first question, um, can you give us some nasiha on the correct etiquette for how to forbid what is wrong. And, you know, specifically here, we, you know, you, you spoke about the greatest wrong being shirk, uh, and we should certainly prioritize that uh, as the greatest wrong to, to correct. But sometimes when we think about forbidding the wrong, uh, we worry about being labeled as a severe critic if we keep telling somebody what you're doing is wrong, people are going to think of us as, as a severe critic. So what's the right balance between speaking up versus keeping silent? Should we try and correct every wrong? Uh, should we try and prioritize the wrongs to, to correct uh, or speak up against? And, and certainly for non-Muslims, you've already mentioned that shirk is the, is the greatest of wrong. But how should we approach these etiquettes of correcting the wrong being the wrong for both Muslims and non-Muslims. So, y yes, uh, from a uh, from a Muslim standpoint, uh, if someone is correcting, if someone is doing a mistake or committing a sin that uh, comes to the attention uh, of uh, of a brother or a sister, then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has taught us. I mean, the, from from the scholars that we know, that the right way to uh, address that is to do it privately. I'm talking about uh, the Muslims uh, committing a sin. I'm assuming that is also part of part of the question. If that's not the case, uh, uh, I hope that the questioner will correct me. Um, no, so if, if if that is the case, I mean, if if a, if a brother or a sister is committing a sin, and if that has come to the notice of another brother, and the best way to approach them is to uh, do it privately, and uh, and the nasiha has to be done sincerely. You're not giving the nasiha for, uh, to show you that you are better than the other person or to show others that you have knowledge. The nasiha has to be done with utmost sincerity and you should do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you sincerely believe in your heart that you are giving this nasiha to correct your brother or to correct your sister. So it starts with sincerity. And as part of the sincerity, we don't want to embarrass or insult the brother or the sister. So we have to do it uh, in a private setting and we advise them. And at the same time, it is also incumbent on the person who's receiving the advice. If he or she is sincere, then he should, he should actually accept that uh, advice from the brother or sister and act upon it. And again, from real life, we know that not everyone agrees to it. Uh, sometimes we may get into a confrontation. At that point, you leave it. I mean, you, you, gave, you gave them your shot and uh, probably that may not be the right time. Uh, probably he or she is going through something. So you leave it at that and then inshallah come back to it later on. It could be a, it could be a one-time deal. I mean, if they, if they just slipped uh, for a moment and they repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't have to worry about it. But if they keep committing a sin, then you are aware of it, then inshallah, then you have to follow the etiquettes of, of doing it privately and then doing it with sincerity and then going back to it from uh, time to time, reminding you, especially if they are closer to you, uh, uh, inshallah. Now, coming to uh, the non-Muslims, yes, I mean, this is something that is a responsibility upon us. And if we, first of all, the greatest shirk is uh, the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Quran, ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal, uh, wal al hasana. So when we invite people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we ask people not to commit shirk, we have to tell them, we have to preach them with wisdom, and we have to preach them with knowledge, 
and we have to give them better advice. We have to advise them in a nice way. We should not get into uh, arguments, even for people who are going to the Dawa booth and attending Dawa uh, uh, events and whatnot. Your goal is there not to win the argument. And sometimes, I mean, uh, people have this habit. They want to show who's superior. Sometimes they get into the mode of debating with the person. That is not our goal. Our goal is to show people the right path. So you use your wisdom. You invite people to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, I, this is not the class for how doing how to do da'wah. Use your wisdom. And the first thing that you call upon them is you call upon them on taqwa, on, on, uh, on the, not taqwa, on tawheed on the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are three things that you have to call upon when you meet someone, when you meet a, a non-Muslim. The first one is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second one is the risala, the prophethood, the message of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third one is the akhirah. And as a matter of fact, a man came to uh, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha and asked, uh, and asked about an issue and she and asked about um, uh, asked about an issue and the Prophet and Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that if Allah were to send the first words as don't drink alcohol, then the people would have said that I'm never going to stop drinking alcohol. If the first verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent were saying don't commit adultery, then the people would have said that I'm not going to uh, stop committing adultery. But the first verses that were sent to Allah, that sent to uh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam were about the jannah and nar, about jahannam, uh, about the paradise and the hellfire. Once people's hearts were attached to paradise and hellfire, then the sharia, then the halal and haram came down. So we have to keep this in mind when we are inviting people. The first thing that you have to call upon is tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa taala. The second one is risala, the message of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Third one is akhira, uh, jannah and nar, and then you move on from there. I know that's a long-winded answer. Hopefully that answered the question. Jazakallah, Karen. Can you uh, explain the meaning of major shirk versus minor shirk and what the level of sin is that's associated with each? And here also, can you speak about what is hidden shirk and is Ria considered to be a hidden shirk and is it forgivable? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> The questions uh, require uh, a lengthy answer. The major shirk, as we know, the the, great, the greatest uh, one of them uh, is uh, uh, is committing associating someone with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and other uh, major shirk are involving in uh, interest and committing adultery and murder and not treating your parents right. There are many categories of uh, major shirk. And I mean, backbiting your brothers, uh, talking back, uh, uh, talking back, uh, I mean, uh, talking behind your brothers and sisters, those are all considered a uh, uh, major shirk. And the hidden shirk, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in one of the hadith that he fears a shirk that is greater than the shirk of the jail. And that is Riyah, that is showing off. That is insincerity. You're doing something not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but for somebody else. So shaitan plays tricks. Uh, he plays tricks with us. Shaitan is not going to come to you directly and tell you that, okay, disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You associate someone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'll take you through smaller paths, if you will. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, uh, he says in the Quran, he says, do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan. And verily, he is an open enemy to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah and many other places, that he will take you slowly away. So if someone were to, let's say, a, a brother or sister is praying uh, in a masjid or in a public place, and and they notice that someone else walked past by or someone uh, that they respect, they walk pa past and now they are making their salah better. They are tr tr trying making their uh, recitation uh, lengthy or, or beautiful or they're making their sujood long, etc. Now they're not doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're doing, doing it for the person who's crossing probably the person that you respect. Now, even though you're not, you're not committing direct shit, now you're giving preference to this person compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't even have to be with the person. It can be with anything, the ta'ud, the false deities. It can be with money. 
for example, uh, you are, uh, if you prefer, the Salah time comes, the Salah time comes and this is the time you, you pray, but something else come, comes in the way you have to go for shopping, you have to take your son out and, and whatnot. I mean, if you do things that are not for Allah, not, not for purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you go into work and you are not working for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are not doing your business according to the teachings of Islam and you do it, okay, you want to earn a profit here and there, you want to get an interest here and there, you want to sell those if you if you try to do these things for other reasons besides allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether it's for your family whether it is for your wealth whether it's for your wife or children those could become a minor shirk so that we have to constantly ask ourselves the question this is good to ask ourselves okay when before doing it am i doing this for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the scholars also say the the beginning and the end niya is important when you start a deed you start a deed with the proper niyyah and end the deed with the proper niyyah. And in between, sometimes our hearts waver and shaitan will come and whisper into our ears and uh, into our hearts and say, no, you're doing this for somebody else. And our hearts might waver. But as long as we start the act with the proper niyyah and end the act with the proper niyyah, in between is for forgiven. And that's what the scholars say. Again, Ria is... Uh, Ria can lead to insincerity and insincerity can, can lead to other uh, sins as well. So we have to be careful about this. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that this is the greatest sin that he is worried about uh, for uh, the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam besides the danger of a Dajjal. What would be one piece of advice that you could give to a 10-year-old boy on how to hold on to the rope of Allah? <laughs> I, I, I have a, a eight-year-old uh, son uh, myself. Uh, soon he'll be ten years old. Uh, ten years, inshallah. Again, I'm I'm not a parenting uh, uh, expert. I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning myself uh, uh, as uh, I'm learning myself as I go along here. I I would say don't push too hard uh, on your children, especially living in this environment uh, don't push too hard uh, and listen to, uh, and listen to them as well sometimes the parents we want to make our children what we could not attain, attain in this world i mean we ourselves wanted to become somebody else in this uh, in this life and we were not able to become one for various reasons and now when we look at our children we want them to <laughs> we want them to become those things that we were not able to become ourselves and that leads to some unrealistic expectations whether it is uh, memorizing the quran whether it is praying uh, praying and things like that sometimes we get into forcing our children and doing those things a 10 year old you teach them the basics uh, you, you teach them the and this is what this is what i uh, follow in my uh, own life with my son as well I don't push him too hard. I, I, I ask him to memorize the Quran. He is memorizing the Quran. Uh, and, but again, I don't push him too hard. I tell him, okay, do what you can. I, I, I'm, if you don't become a hafid, that's fine. I mean, if Allah wills, he will become a hafid. And when it comes to prayer, I will ask him to pray. Uh, and sometimes, of course, he gets lazy and whatnot. Don't be hard on them. Tell them in a nice way that, uh, again, as parents, sometimes the anger will get the better of us. But we have to kind of take a, take a step back and see what's best for our children in the long run. We don't want our children to hate Islam and the Muslims uh, uh, down the road. And we advise them, okay, prayer is important and slowly, but not, don't feed them too much. But time from time to time, uh, you advise them. And as as... As parents, we also want, try to protect our children from everything that is around us. We try to make them live uh, in a very, uh, what is it, in a bubble, if you will, and especially living in this country that is not going to work. If you're going to protect your children from all kinds of uh, external effects, if you will. If you're not, go, shut them, shut, shut the TV down, shut the iPhone down, shut the iPad down. If you're going to keep them in this bubble. And one day they're going to be 17 years old and they're going to go out and see the world. And if you keep them in this bubble and once they see what others are seeing when they go out of the uh, house, then that becomes their only aim in life. 
So we don't want that to happen. I mean, we, we cannot protect the children. We cannot make them live in this bubble. Again, this is something that I follow in my own life with my son as well. I mean, he watches uh, TV from time to time. Of course, we know what he is watching. Uh, and we don't put too much restrictions uh, on him. Uh, as, as long as we kind of keep up the, the uh, what to say, the, the gradual advice and keep them to the Quran and the Salah uh, and don't protect them too much, listen to them from time to time, inshallah, hopefully they will become better Muslims. Uh, Again, trying to protect them and keep them in the bubble. I see many parents doing this, and I've also heard stories that when they go out of their homes, that they become somebody else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our children. We hear ayah 102 quite often in the Jummah Qutbah. Oh, you who believe, fear Allah, you should be feared and die not in, except in the state of Islam. Two questions regarding this ayah. Firstly, how do we know whether we are just fearing Allah or whether we're actually fearing him as he should be feared? And, and secondly, uh, is there a historical context to why we hear this ayah so often in the Jummah Qutbah? So I, I gave the historical uh, aspect uh, at the beginning of the, uh, of the session uh, today. So I talked about the, the background is the Battle of Bu'ath. Uh, where uh, uh, the Aws and Khazraj, they were uh, fighting amongst each other. And uh, later on, when they, uh, when, they, when they became together, the Jews, uh, they were trying to create discord. They were trying to uh, create dissension between the two tribes. And they were trying to uh, take them away from their brotherhood. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, are you going to go back to disbelief? As a matter of fact, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he used the same word. So... Then just coming back to that, bringing them back to this uh, advice of brotherhood, unity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, yeah, after mentioning those verses from 99 to 101, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And remember, if you look at the last, this verse, then he immediately connects that with, after saying, do not die in the state of disbelief, do not, start, do not die in the state, except in the state of Islam. And then he immediately connects that with, hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as if both of them are related. You holding on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is part of your iman, is part of you considered to be a Muslim. So if you're calling yourself a Muslim, then this is also a requirement. One of the requirements of the Muslim is that you be, you build this brotherhood, you build this sisterhood. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like I said, the, the, the battle of Du'ath and the subsequent uh, 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 incident that we already talked about. And as far as haqqa tuqatih, uh, I mean, uh, taqwa, taqwa is basically uh, the, 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 the traditional or the classical scholars, they say it's tarq al ma'asiyah. It's leaving the sins. Uh, taqwa comes from you being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, realizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you, not just in your public life, not just when you're around people, but even when you are in your private life, when you're in your bedroom, when you're in your room, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still watching you. And, tarqal, and this, like I said, the classical scholars, they translate, they, uh, one of the definitions they give for taqwa is tarq al It's leaving the sins. You abstain from the sins. You stay away from the sins. So it's not just believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believing in the Prophet that constitutes iman, but you fulfilling the obligations and staying away from the sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us, uh, commanded us to stay away from. That is also part of taqwa. And that, and, that is, and that is how you give the haq to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are giving the true haq to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by following this aspect of Islam. You just don't say la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and go out and collect, uh, in, give or take interest. You don't go out and commit fahsha. You don't go out and do drugs or do uh, alcohol, drink alcohol. So you have to, that, the, you have to internalize what you're saying verbally. When you say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you have to internalize it and you have to practice in, uh, in, uh, in your life as well. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not all, none of us are perfect. We commit mistakes. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us on the straight path. Allahumma ameen. Okay, inshallah, this will be the last question. So actually it's a couple of things related to backbiting. 
Um, firstly, can you clarify whether backbiting is a major sin or is it a major shirk? That's the first point. And then the second point is, if I have committed backbiting in the past to some regarding somebody, what should I do about it now? I'm worried that if I confront the person and seek forgiveness, they'll get angry and it will ruin our relationship. What should I do? Uh, sorry, Brother Ashok, actually my uh, connect connection just got, uh, got disconnected for a while and I didn't hear the full question. Can you repeat it for me? Yeah, so um, a couple of things related to backbiting. Firstly, can you clarify if it's a major sin or is it a major shirk? And then secondly, if I have committed backbiting against somebody in the past, what is my responsibility now? I'm worried that if I approach the person and I talk to him and I seek his forgiveness, he'll get angry and it will ruin our relationship. What should I do? So a backbiting is a major sin, uh, the sin that can take away uh, your rewards when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one of the, uh, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, takes, I mean, when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he disposes the rights of each other after crossing the hellfire, uh, so a person can lose his uh, rewards if he does backbiting and that is considered a major sin. And as far as backbite, uh, if you have done something, if you're slandered or if you've uh, said bad things about a brother or a sister in the past, then yes, uh, the, again, this is something the scholars advise as well, that don't go and tell the brother or sister that you've done such and such in the past, and that may create uh, further issues. What is recommended by the scholars is you now to compensate for that sin, that you, you now say good things about the person in the public and you tell others the good aspects of that brother or sister to compensate for the sin that you have committed in the past. Again, Allahu A'lam, uh, and that is something uh, uh, the scholars have advised uh, as well, is don't go and say this, uh, tell the people that you've done such and such thing, but instead you do good things. You say good things about uh, them in public to compensate for the sin that you've committed in the past, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive um, uh, our uh, transgressions. Jazakallah care, Brother Riaz. That's um, really great, and thanks for the, the words of advice. Inshallah, we will conclude here. Um, inshallah, next week we will have um, Dr. Dawood uh, Nasimi, and inshallah, he will be covering verses from Surah An Nur. And with that, we will conclude. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illand. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Awadu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim wal asr inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-lazina amunu wa amilu al-salihat wa tawasaw bil-haq wa tawasaw bil-sabr sadaqallahu al-azim